That's good. Um, so today does end our wake-up call series, and next week starts James. But we do have to remember a couple of people, Tom Link and Gladys. Gladys, uh, her brother uh, went home to be with the Lord on Friday morning, and his funeral is going to be October the 11th. But then uh, Gladys, uh, Tom took her to the hospital yesterday, and um, she, her blood pressure was 200 over 150, and that's never good. And so she's in the hospital as we speak. So let's just remember that family in prayer. And then uh, last week during the service, uh, Barb Nicely's sister passed away, and we had that funeral uh, this past Thursday. So I'm going to pause for prayer. Lord, all the families that we've mentioned, and thank you for the praise of Nate and uh, his sister-in-law. And it's been a long, tough battle there, and we, th we thank you for that. Uh, healing and we just pray now for uh, the link family and we pray for the nicely family and help us as we talk today in Christ I pray amen okay so a wake-up call will help my prayer life how many <laughs> yeah I get it a wake-up call will help and, and, and you know thank the Lord that I have the power and the privilege uh, to pray to a God uh, when life is uh, throwing me a lot of curves and I've had a wake-up call. A wake-up call can do that. A wake-up call has the uh, power and the potential to wake us up, to put us on the right track because God loves us and he wants the best for us. A wake-up call, will uh, it'll come in all shapes and sizes. Uh, it's God, it can be God-designed. God will allow it to happen. And we have a loving God and we serve a loving God who um, wants our attention. And to reiterate, and the key to learning is repetition and over and over, it's always better to give God your attention than for him to have to get it. God, uh, a wake-up call, can, it can happen to a country, it can happen to a nation, it can happen to a world. Uh, it can happen to a church. It can happen to a family. Uh, it, can happy, it can happen to an individual. And God just wants to reach deep inside of us. And, and uh, he wants to get a hold of that, uh, that potential and to rejuvenate and to rekindle and all the re-adjectives you can think of and to renew and refresh and, and the passion and the purpose and to protect from the dangers of sin and the dangers of sins, the danger of sins. Um, we, uh, we've had an uproar in the church, and we have to talk about it. And it's out of Acts 20. <laughs> I scared you to death. Yeah. Paul, <laughs> what happened? I don't even know what happened. Okay. We've had an uproar in the church. And Paul is preaching about Jesus. And he's talking about uh, the new way. And he's talking about the kingdom of God. And, of course, there was a large group who said, what, we killed Jesus. Uh, we've, we, 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 wiped, we wiped that away. We wiped Christianity away. And the disciples are the one that stole his body. And so they kept... You know, they bring all that up. And to this very day, according to Scripture, uh, that's how they do away with the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Uh, but Jesus is alive and well. And they're saying that, hey, you know what, Paul now and his band of desperados, uh, they're out talking on this, uh, on Christ, and, and people are being converted to Christianity. we got to put a stop to it. Well, in... Um, I'm not going to look at all these verses. I'm going to start in verse 7. But in verse 1 of Acts 20, uh, Paul calls for all the believers together. And here's what he does. He encourages them. Paul was an encourager. Uh, Paul was encouraging these believers. And boy, it's good to be encouraged, isn't it? It's good to have our spirits lifted up. It's good to have the burdens lifted, you know. And you're encouraged when you hear a good report. Uh, you come in here and, uh, you know, you prayerfully and hopefully, you know, you're encouraged by what's said, uh, by what is sung. We all need encouragement. 
And Paul knew that in the heat of persecution and what was going on with Christians, he needed to encourage them. So then he, he travels to uh, Macedonia. And there he, he stays for a little while. And one morning, now work with me just a little bit. One morning, Paul is in, he's in scripture. He is? Yeah, he's in the, let's just say he's, let's just say he's in the Pentateuch. The first, uh, the first uh, five uh, copies of scripture, Genesis and Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers and Deuteronomy. Let's just say he's reading in, now how do you know that? Well, we know he was in the word, uh, you know, Jesus read from Isaiah in the temple. Uh, so he's, he's in the word, God's talking to him and in the morning because he instructs us, you know, through passages of scripture that, uh, that he had written and that he has written in scripture, you know, to encourage us to pray daily, to renew our minds daily, uh, to renew our spirits daily. And so uh, let's just say that Paul's in Numbers and he's reading this scripture, uh, Numbers 13. And uh, verse 17, and it's Moses and the men give these instructions. Moses is saying, go out and, uh, you know, explore the land. Go north through Negev into the hill country. Well, the people were pretty negative about it because, you know, of the land and the enemies that were in the land. Uh, and then possibly Paul read this because he's encouraging people. But the people living there, they're powerful. This is what the people are saying. And their towns are large and fortified. Uh, we even saw giants there, descendants of Anak. And the Amalekites lived there in the Gev, and the Hittites, and the, and the Jebusites, and the Amorites live in the hill country. And the Canaanites live along the coast of the Mediterranean Sea, along the Jordan Valley. But Caleb, but Caleb tried to quiet the people as they stood before Moses. And in quotation marks, here's what Caleb said. Let's go at once to take the land, he said. We can certainly conquer it. And so Paul, he's just, we don't know what he was reading, but he's encouraging. Man, he's under this veil of persecution himself. He's going from from town to town, from island to island, and he's preaching Jesus. And in verse 3 of 20, he, encourage, he encourages believers again. He's in Macedonia. And there in Macedonia, he's there for three months. And while in Macedonia, Paul hears about a plot to take his life. So now his, his life is in jeopardy. And so he sails to Troas, goes to Troas. Now, you know, when reading this passage of Scripture in Acts 20, I, I, I think, well, you know what? Paul needs encouragement. Paul, as a, as a leader, and he's been going, he's been giving himself, you know, and uh, he's been leading people to Jesus and leading people to the kingdom of God. And, and now his life's in jeopardy, and he's, he's going to sail to uh, uh, to Troas. Now he's got a group of men with him and they're mentioned there in Acts 20 and the verses that follow one, two, and three. And these men, no doubt, as they banded together, they were a, they were a strong team. And, uh, here they're headed to Troas. Now I've been, uh, in that part of the world and, uh, it's an interesting part of the world. And later on this evening, as uh, you're sleeping, <laughs> I'll be flying over that part of the world again on my way to Africa. And, you know, people have been so encouraging here. Johnny said, I wish you would hurry up and get back. Man, I've been, I'm tired of praying. And he just, how about that? Uh, but I appreciate the prayers. And I know that a lot of you have come up. And Mike Tucker, who just had surgery uh, last Thursday, had, uh, they went in this way and he's here today. And uh, he's got a brace on his neck, and thank God for his faithfulness. But he sent me uh, a little video, and he said, you know, I thought since you were in that part of the world in Africa, and he asked me if I'd ever seen this movie. I said, yeah. And so, you know, last week we had the 16-foot anaconda that we showed you, and so he thought he would encourage me by sending me this video right here. 
Quinn is out of the picture. We have no more suspects or clues. But I have instincts, Spike. And my instincts tell me we're getting closer. I can feel it. I can feel it like it's right in my neck! Run! <laughs> 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 Starting to get numb. <laughs> Three darkies, too much. Is that Carter? <laughs> I think I lost him. Hey. <laughs> All right. Hey, you know who needs? <laughs> Sorry, Carter. <laughs> who needs enemies when you have friends like that guy back there? <laughs> Oh, oh, man. Oh, well. Well, Acts 20. Acts 20. Thanks for the encouragement, Mike. Acts 20. Uh, I want to read. Let's read 7, beginning in verse 7. On the first day of the week, we gathered with local believers to share in the Lord's Supper. Paul was preaching to them, and since he was leaving the next day, he kept talking unto midnight. No. Since I'm leaving, I'm not going to speak here till uh, midnight, okay? Now, I've heard some messages I thought were going to midnight. Have y'all? Yes, we have. All of us have. The upstairs rooms where we met was lighted with many flickering lamps. And as Paul spoke on and on, a young man named Eutychus sitting on the windowsill became very drowsy. Finally, he fell sound of sleep and dropped three stories to his death below. Now, that's taken sleeping in church to the extreme. <laughs> Paul went down, bent over him, <laughs> took him into his arms and said, don't worry. He said, he's alive. And then they all went back upstairs, shared in the Lord's Supper, ate together Paul continued talking then till dawn. Man, how about that message? And then he left. Sure he did, and we're all there. Meanwhile, the young man was taken home alive and well, and everyone was greatly relieved. <laughs> now listen, uh, that's, that's not funny. The guy died, but, but Paul brought him back. He went to sleep in church. That's kind of funny. You know, now Paul was a great, he was a great teacher. Paul was gifted. Uh, Paul, no doubt, you know, in his studies uh, that he, you know, he, he studied uh, in, in preparation for what he was about to do to go out. He spent three years uh, in, in, in studying. If I say the name right, Gamaliel, I believe that's the correct name of the man who tutored him, who he studied under. And so he was an intellect. Uh, you know, he was on the Sanhedrin, the Council of the Sanhedrin at one time. Uh, so he was well-spoken, articulate. He was a, but now he's a, he's a great speaker. He's got the Holy Spirit in him. He's got words from above. I mean, they're flowing out of his mouth. You've heard great speakers. Uh, remember back in 2015 when we had Chris Tonto Peranto here from Benghazi? And, uh, you know, the movie 13 Hours and, and uh, just he and four or five others, you know, that staved off the, the terrorist. And, uh, man, you were like on the edge, uh, edge of your seat listening to every word. And when he was finished, it's, man, that's, that's over? Remember when we had Charles Harris from 9-11, uh, uh, New York City, the fireman who was over all the funerals there and, 
in New York City at the time of the tragedy, and we had him uh, come in, and he spoke, and you know his soft-spoken voice, but yet you hung on. You know, you hung on to every word, and we've had guests, you know, like Jamie. Jamie can speak. He has this humor, and it gives him a lot of levity uh, of things to say, and you can think of speakers that, man, you could just listen to for, you know, for a long time. Well, Paul had a story. I mean, Paul is a guy who's been chasing uh, believers and having them drug out of their house, and he's having them thrown into prison. And uh, he's out after every Jesus follower or anyone who claims to be a follower of Christ. You know, he's, he, he's, he's after them. And then Christ after him. And, and Christ just kind of hunts him down. And there on that road to Damascus, he gives his heart to Christ. Now he's a follower of Christ. And he's been beaten. He's been thrown into prison. You know, he's willing to give his life up for the cause of Christ. So he has a story. So I would have to say he wasn't boring when he spoke. You know, with all the experiences that he had. You know, somebody can come up here and they've had a life experience. You know, and they tell a story and there's something about that, that story that just kind of pulls you in. You know, they're great storytellers. And, you know, Paul is, he, he's sharing, he's speaking He's speaking the word before it's even written. And, and he is, he, he's, these people are mesmerized. Verse 9, though, of that, of Acts 20, verse 9 says, he spoke on and on and on. And so this young guy gets drowsy. He's sitting in a window seal and he falls to his death. Now there's no glass in those days, there's just open windows. He's three floors up. He's three stories high. And he falls to his death. Now, we've all been sleepy in church. Some of us are sleepy right now. Uh, and, you know, the nice thing about, um, you know, the lights being a little low, and people will say, Matt, why do you have, why, why, why? You know, well, I have ADD, and it helps me with any distraction that goes on. And so I really can't see you. I can't see your eyes. For all I know, everybody in here could be just, they could be nodded out. We've all been there. Uh, you know, who knows, this guy working, maybe he worked so hard that day, you know, out in that Middle Eastern sun. And, you know, he finally, you ever, you, you ever work so, you know, or you stay up so late and you're just, you know, your mind is just not engaged. But you finally come to a place where you just sit down. And it just, whew, boy, and your, your head just, you know, starts. Have you ever done that? Oh, man, you got drool, you know, dripping uh, off the side, you know. And I'd sit in class. You ever done this where you, you sit in class and you're, and you're writing and the teacher is talking and you're, and you're trailing off. You don't even know what you're writing. You know, it's just, <laughs> it, it, it's so bad. Uh, uh, but here's what I got to say. How does this story affect us? How does this affect us in a in a wake-up call. Well, it has a good ending. <laughs> it has a good ending when he fell to his death. Paul and everybody runs down, <laughs> runs down the stairs and uh, they see him laying there and Paul leans over him and whew, raises him right up. Now, I'm going to listen to a guy that can raise somebody from the dead. <laughs> I'm going to be all ears. <laughs> I'm going to be engaged. And uh, uh, so what... How does this, how does this affect us? Well, um, I asked myself that question in reading that passage because when I asked the Lord, you know, what can I talk about on this last week of wake-up call? I immediately thought of this guy falling out of that window seal and falling to his death, sleeping in church. <laughs> well, Satan is doing his dead-level best to lull the church to sleep. He's, he's doing everything in his power to keep us from what is important. As a community of believers, as a church, there will be, you know, a, there'll be distractions. There'll be uh, inner conflict. There'll be drama. He'll do everything anything and everything 
to keep our attention off what Christ wants us to be attentive to and the community around us and people who are dying and people who are going to hell and people who need Christ. He'll do anything in his power. It's an interesting article out of uh, Christianity Today by a man by the name of Greg Stiers. Greg Stiers is a, uh, a youth minister, youth leader here in the country, and he organized an organization called Dare to Share. And here's what Greg, this is an interesting article because I relate it to this. Really, the, uh, the, uh, I said it had a good ending. You know, verse 12. Verse 12 uh, is, meanwhile, the young man was taken home alive and well, and everyone was greatly relieved. Yes, they were. But he was dead. And so I, I tried to spiritualize this context. The church today needs young people. The church today needs young people. If the church today doesn't have young people, the church is going to die. The church today, we were all young once, and we've, we've done the work, we've done the mission, we've done things that are possible, we've, we've looked back and we've reminisced and we've loved the days that have gone by and we long for those days again and, and, and we look to that and there's nothing wrong with doing that. Some of you, as faithful as you are, and I, I look across uh, the dim lit auditorium uh, at my desire, I, I just, I see a lot of people and I, there's a lot of faithfulness here and there's a lot of people who have spent a lot of years in reaching out and outreaches and community outreaches and you know better than anybody else, a church without young people will crash and burn. And that's why this, to spiritualize that context, Paul rushes down these steps and he rescues this young person. Greg Stiers said in the next few years, 35 million young people, 35 million young people will disaffiliate themselves from Christianity. And these 35 young million young people raised in Christian homes, Christian homes, wow. And Greg Stiers says we can't just slow down the bleeding we can't slow it down we have to flip the switch and so the question would be well then how how do we do that how 35 million think about it that's a staggering statistic you know in the next 10 to 15 to 20 to 25 years they will disaffiliate themselves from the church from christianity uh, not even mentioning uh, that they're believers or Christians. Greg Stiers, here's what Stiers says. This gives the church the greatest missional opportunity that's ever been presented to them. It's greater than, now if you're, uh, you know, a revival, you look at revivals that have happened, you know, in the past, like the Azusa a revival that started in, in, in 1906 by an African-American preacher. And man, he was preaching repentance and preaching gospel. And, and people came to Christ by, by the thousands and revival broke out. It was in Los Angeles and for nine years. And, and Stiers even went on to say that because of this missional opportunity that we'll see if, if hearts are focused and we're driven to this missional uh, opportunity, if you will, even more than what Billy Graham has experienced in conversions and people coming to Christ. Well, when you take that kind of a statement and you put it next to Joel chapter 2, when Joel the prophet said, in the last days, God will pour out his spirit upon all men, all women, all children, God will be pouring out his spirit. People will be coming to Christ. Yes. Today, in today's world, 
uh, the statistic is between 70 and 73 percent of the American population say that they are Christians. Now, according to the way this is going, that Steyer says in these next 10 to 15, 20, even 30 years, that would put us around 2050, that uh, there'll be a drop to 54, 50 to 54 percent of people so he's saying this he's saying that this would be the the biggest disaffiliation if you will the biggest numer the fastest numerical shift that this country has ever seen uh, when it comes to religion period that we could that we could stand to lose an entire generation of souls, and that's a wake-up call. An entire, wow, an entire generation of souls? Well, then what can we do? You know, when you hear statements like that and you hear statistics like that, you know, you just, you feel helpless. You know, what can we do? What can we do? Well, you know, I remembered what our pastor, Dr. John, used to say in our staff meetings, and so I put it in note this morning. And he would say, he'd say, you know what, fellas, we got to pray. We got to pray. And uh, he, he would say, we have to mobilize. And before he'd say, before we can evangelize, we have to mobilize. We have to organize. Then we evangelize. And so we ask God, you know, how, you know, how can we do that? How can we visualize that? Well, we, we, know, we, ought to, we know we have to pray. Paul, you know... It, he said, listen, we got to continue and pray, praying always, praying always, praying always, praying always. So we're calling on prayer partners and uh, believers in this privilege and opportunity that we have as Christians to pray, you know, to an almighty God, to pray that the Holy Spirit would move upon the heart, to pray that God would give us vision and, you know, how can we meet? How can we meet the needs? How can we reach young people? How can we do what we need to do, you know, to fill up, uh, to fill up a church with young people and not just to fill up a church with people, but to see them come to Christ and then disciple them to where they go out and take, you know, this vision of organizing and mobilizing, reaching those that they know and their peers. It can happen. Nothing is impossible with God. Nothing is impossible with God. You know, um, I was asked uh, a few, Matt, why, why the biker Sunday? I don't know. <laughs> it's fun. You know, we do. We have a lot of, we had a lot of fun last week. And, um, you know, I'll be honest, in the last couple of years, I thought, well, you know, but what's happened is in the last four years uh, that we have really uh, reached into uh, some secular biker clubs to where they're showing up on this Sunday. And last Sunday was the largest group that we've ever had for Biker Sunday. And we've, we, we had some salvations. It was, it was wonderful. And, and Grizz, my buddy Grizz, um, who is president of one of the local chapters uh, here in the, the city, uh, he just said, Matt is an untouched group. Nobody, there's not one person that's ministering to these bikers uh, to go to where they go. He said it can, be, uh, it can be dangerous. It can be, you know, just a risk, a risk to take. But he said God's given me an opportunity because they trust. And they tell me, here's what they've told me. He said landmark, and this is kudos to y'all. Because here's what a lot of them said, and there was a lot of new bikers this year. What was being said to Grizz is, we've number one, we've never felt so welcome. We weren't ex expecting this at a church. And y'all made over them, and uh, there were T-shirts made for them, and Dave Dorfline and uh, Leon Moorhead, man, they just, they cooked all, 
all morning, you know, and, and fed all of them. We almost, he had food for 450 people and we only had five burgers left. So we fed a lot of people after the 11 o'clock service. Well, I got a text from Grizz on uh, Sunday night. He said, I think that was it for me. I think I'm done. And I said, no, you got a few more years left in you uh, for Biker Sunday because I, I, I was the, kind of the same way. But every time, you know, just something happened, God rejuvenates my spirit to say, man, we've got something going here. And he said, no, I think I'm, I, I, that's it. He said, I can't stand up anymore. And, you know, my health is bad. I just can't do it. And I left it at that. And then I get a text early Monday morning. I had some doubts last night. Please forgive me. I am ready for next year to do a bigger and better year in trying to reach people with the gospel. And so here's, here's what happened. Apparently, uh, some guys called and said they were really impacted by what happened last Sunday. And so Grizz, a week from Wednesday night, he's going to encourage. And Johnny and I went to, went to see him this past week. And he's going to encourage his bikers to come to prayer meeting on Wednesday night at 6.15. And then, and then he's going to have a Bible study with them. He's going to have a Bible study with them on Wednesday nights at 7 o'clock. And he said, Matt, God, and so I took him over the James series, and he's going to do the James series with these. Isn't that, to me, that's just incredible. It is wonderful because that's how revival starts. You know, people's hearts are, man, what can I do? What can I do? Well, here's a guy who says, here's what I'm going to do. And here's what I can do. And uh, that's how revivals, you know, revival seems to always start when you look at history in a dark place. When Jonathan Edwards revival, you know, America was in a dark place at that time. And Jonathan Edwards, when he spoke his message, sinners in the hands of an angry God. I don't know if you know this or not, but he was in a, he was in a wheelchair on the platform. And uh, he couldn't see very well, so he held his message right up, to his, right up to his face, and he read the message. And the Holy Spirit was so evident, so powerful of what was happening. People were just running. They were running. A lot of young people. It's a lot of young people. You and I both know as we get older, we, just, we get a little colder if we don't have Christ in our lives. You know, people get set in their ways. And I'm not talking about you. I'm just talking generally about people, you know, who, you know, I'm not interested in Christ. I'm not interested. I'm not interested. And you just, you get farther and farther and farther away. And, and this is a wake-up call because according to Scripture, one day God quits calling. Proverbs chapter 1. And, and, that, and that's a scary wake-up right there. You know, to be sensitive and to be open to the Holy Spirit and what the Holy Spirit, you know, wants to do in our lives and the lives of others. That's, do you know today there's more churches than high schools and junior high schools put together? It's five to one ratio. And, and, and there's a lot of young people who need Christ. And we can't just let, you know, well, let's just let the youth leader, let him do it, let him worry about that. We have to band together and work together and visualize like a... And I just want to mention this in closing. I am, I am looking forward to leaving today as I, you know, head to Africa. And, and uh, you know, there's the camp I'm going to. They've already had 14,000 young people come through that camp. And uh, I'm going to be there this week and I'm going to, I'm going to enjoy. I'm going to have the opportunity to speak and, and, and teach. And so I'm looking forward to that. All the camps combined together. There's been over 150,000 young people. Uh, that have attended these camps. And 30 to 40% of these young people that attend these camps give their heart to Jesus. Man, there's revival going on in different parts of the world. I was just given a, my phone's over there on the side. I won't take the time to get it. Uh, but uh, somebody, uh, Ken Ball, sent me a, an email this week about Iran. You know, Iran being in the news as it is. But the world's largest church in the world today is the underground church and it's in Iran uh, they're leaving the mosques the mosques are empty because there's emptiness in the Islamic faith and they're finding that out 
And people are coming to Christ and they're giving their hearts to Jesus. And there is an explosion of revival in Iran right now as we speak. And those who are working with the, the underground church. China's the same, uh, the same example we have of Christians getting together in the underground church. A desire, a hunger for the word of God. An explosion of the spirit. He said, I'll pour out my spirit on all men and women. And a lot of this in Iran, speaking of women, are women leaders who are teaching the gospel and, and, and they're in position. And all we're seeing is scripture being fulfilled and what God's doing in these days. These are great days in which we live in. And I just quote, I just want to quote Greg Stiers. Man, we have the greatest missional opportunity that's ever been presented to the church is right now. And it's a wake-up call to the church to wake us up 